Uriah, go to the New Testament book, Matthew, take a left, um, and if you're kind of new to the Bible, new to church, you'll see Malachi, or Malachi, take another brief left, there's Zechariah. You may have never heard a sermon from Zechariah, but uh, it's a fascinating book, uh, but I am excited to get into the New Testament. We haven't looked at any New Testament passages in the year 2024, isn't that crazy? But it doesn't seem that way. You know why? Because we've seen Jesus throughout the Old Testament. In every passage of the Old Testament, Jesus surfaces. Such a beautiful concept. And today is no different. That's why I've called the message today, The Gospel According to Zechariah. The gospel according to Zechariah. Now, before we start, I just want to take a moment, and I, I want us to ask one question. Now, whether you're 10 years old or 100 years old, we all have an answer to this question. You ready? What is, it's going to be on the screen, what's the one thing that I've done that I feel guilty about? What's that thing? All right, all, all the wives just start, you know, uh, you know, hit, hit your husband right there in the ribs where it hurts. What's the one thing that I've done that I feel guilty about? What's the one thing you regret? Now, b besides being Mississippi State fans or Ole Miss fans, what's the one thing? Like the serious thing, okay? What's the, kids, what, what's the one thing that keeps you up at night? Maybe, maybe you lie to your parents. And it's just eating you alive. Maybe you exploited someone else and the guilt. Is, is shame. Maybe, maybe you survived the tragic event, but your family members or friends did not survive, and you have survivor's guilt. What's the thing you feel guilty about? Maybe you're a parent. Maybe you feel guilty because you don't spend enough time with your children. There's guilt. No matter who you are, if you are alive today, you have felt guilt. But the question is, what do we do about it? When we experience guilt, how do we escape guilt? Now, Zechariah 3 is going to give us that answer today. So the year, contextually, is 538 B.C. King Cyrus of the great Persian Empire conquers Babylon. He signs a decree. He allows Jews to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. That's the context. So together with Haggai, if you were here on Wednesday, you would know all of this. Zechariah returns to Jerusalem and helps resume the construction of this temple, a new temple. It started 18 years prior, but they just got lazy. They got distracted. They lost focus, and they quit. And so the, the book of Zechariah, written somewhere around 520 B.C., and, and then the temple gets finalized around 516 B.C. So here in Zechariah, there are 14 chapters of eight really strange visions that God gave Zechariah about Israel being the apple of God's eye. That's the content of Zechariah. We're going to look at the fourth vision today in Zechariah 3, and we're going to discover three steps in the gospel of Zechariah that all of us will walk through as true believers in Jesus. Three steps. The gospel is clearly presented in the book of Zechariah. And as in these steps, in this scripture, we'll see our testimony and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, the first step, number one, Satan condemns us in sin. That's number one. All right? Satan condemns us in sin. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to do what? To accuse him. Now Joshua, listen, the high priest, he had the high calling to reconstruct the temple. In fact, more specifically, 
He was called to set up the altar. That's where the business of God happened. In the new temple, he was the direct descendant of the Aaronic priesthood. So Joshua here, he's standing before this cosmic tribunal, this eternal justice court, and he's being accused by the prosecutor as being unfit as a priest. Do you see it? That's the vision. That's the vision that we see. And God hears the judge, but not just the judge. God is also the defender. And Satan is the accuser against Joshua in this heavenly courtroom. And let me just pause right here and just say this. If Joshua, listen church, if Joshua the high priest is being accused, how much more will we be accused? Think about that. Just think about it. So Satan here, he's both the enticer and the accuser. In other words, in one moment, Satan says, look, go ahead. You do whatever you need to do to make you happy. You deserve it. But on the other hand, the very next moment, he stands before God and says, hey, hey, Mr. Judge, look at what they did. Look at how evil they are. They don't deserve to be in your presence. So Satan here both attracts us and he entices us. And then he attacks us and then accuses us. And the enemy knows, listen, if he can get you to focus on yourselves, if he can get us to focus on our sin, if he can get us to focus on on hopelessness, under a cloud of despair, he can destruct our life. And destruction is all around us. And that's the result of losing our focus. Despair led to desecration that led to defeat. You ever been there? You've been defeated? You ever been standing before God with filthy rags, not knowing what to do, feeling shame, helplessness? Hopelessness? Well, here's the encouragement. Satan doesn't have the last word. Notice how the Lord speaks of himself in third person in verse 2. Listen, listen to this. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. That God here, he's speaking to himself in third person because he's the defender and the judge. Did you catch it? In the case against Joshua, God is the defender and the judge. And he reminds Satan who is going to win the case. Regardless of the prosecutorial evidence, he's going to remind Satan, I'm going to win this case. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord has what? Look, chosen Jerusalem. Rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Look, Israel thought all hope was lost. I mean, we, we've been wandering in the wilderness in captivity. We've been conquered by Babylon and the Assyrian Empire. All is lost. No hope. We're going to burn. And let me just pause right here and say, God is declaring He has the last word. Not Babylon, not Assyria, not Egypt. I have the last word word i will be resuscitating i will be reviving i will be reconstituting the faith community of israel and let me just pause right here and say if you're a believer in jesus this is exactly who you are and what you are you are a brand plucked out of the fire yeah you deserve the fire but you are plucked from the fire because listen Jesus is our high priest Jesus is resuscitating Jesus is reviving and Jesus is reconstituting your faith but look here's the deal it does not change Joshua's sinful reality 
All right? Watch this. Satan, in one sense, is right. He's correct. Look at verse 3. Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed in what? Filthy garments. Filthy garments. Joshua, the high priest, is standing on behalf of his people, filthy and guilty. Now Satan's charge, his challenge, is correct. Joshua has a problem. He's got a big problem. And the problem is this, look. Why would Joshua have the right to state his case? Why, why would he stand on behalf of his people before holy God in filthy rags? That's a great question. If you go back in Leviticus, the high priest had to dress in the finest, the purest linens. And so Satan here has cogently and concisely made his case against Joshua. He is unclean. He is unsuitable for service. Can't do it. He is covered in foul, filthy rags. We don't want to go into details on exactly how filthy they were, but let me just say his appearance was disgusting. It was defiling. It was deplorable. Guilty, Joshua, as charged. You're guilty. That's not the end of the story. Number one, Satan condemns us in sin. And here's the good part. Number two, the Savior converts us in salvation. The Savior converts us in salvation. Look at verse four. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, I love this key word, remove. Whew. Remove all the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, behold, Best three words in the Bible. You ready? I have taken. Oh, that's good. Underline that. Circle that in your Bible. I have taken, absolved, removed. I have taken your iniquity away from you. And I will clothe you with what? Pure vestments. Whew. The Lord stands. Listen. As Joshua's lawyer, the advocate to absolve, and not only that, to atone for his sin. The lawyer is taking it upon himself to take away his client's guilt. Isn't that, isn't that unfathomable? You're like, it's not even fair. No, but it's the most loving thing to do. It's the most just thing to do. It's the most right thing to do. It's the only thing that can rescue him from being before God in filthy rags. So just in case you missed the picture here, this is exactly what Jesus has done for you and for me. This is a picture, a foreshadowing of what Jesus has done. He's exchanged filthy garments for fine garments, repugnant garments to righteous garments, unholy guilt to unsurpassed glory. That's what Jesus does. All because, listen, Joshua, the high priest, he had the best defender on the planet. And the defense, he stands up, tells the prosecution, look, I see your point. He is guilty. He's guilty as charged. But what if I give him a new wardrobe? What if I do that? Then, then your accusation will become acquittal. And Jesus takes all of our guilt and sin, and he exchanges for all of his grace and salvation from rags to righteousness because Jesus took upon himself what you and me deserve wow that's the gospel according to Zechariah look at verse 5 it gets better and I said let them put a clean turban on his head so they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments and the angel of the Lord was standing by. Now you go back and you look at Exodus 28 and you can see this clean turban. 
And the, the clean turban in Exodus 28 tells us that there is an inscription on the front of this turban that says, Holy unto Yahweh. Holy unto Yahweh. From putrid to pure, from sinful to spotless, in one instant moment. Satan condemns us in sin. The Savior converts us in salvation. I was listening this morning uh, to uh, Adrian Rogers preach, and, and this is what he said, which is a fascinating quote about how you should feel about your salvation. And here was his quote. It feels like standing in Jesus' shoes because Jesus is standing in yours. Wow. You're standing in Jesus' shoes because he's standing in yours. So the, the, the Satan condemns us in sin. That's true. Number two, Savior converts us in salvation. And lastly, the sovereign charges us in sanctification. The sovereign charges us in sanctification. Now look, contrary to American evangelical Christianity, Christianity does not start and stop at the moment that you are saved that you're justified. That's the very beginning. The Lord here charges us in sanctification. In fact, salvation actually prepares us for a brand new season called sanctification. And this is where we see this in Scripture in verse 6. And the angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua, listen to this, verse 7, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If... You will walk in my ways and keep my charge. Then you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts. And I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. In other words, Joshua, you're not clean for nothing. You're not clean to just sit and soak you're clean to be mobilized and work, to be sanctified. J Joshua here, he's bearing testimony in all of his life what God has done. So if Joshua walks with the Lord, then he will rule over the people the Lord has entrusted to him. What's the implication? Great question. Here's the implication. To rule in God's courts, don't miss this, requires us to walk in God's commands. You want to lose all your respect. You want to lose uh, all of your character and integrity. You don't have the right to rule in God's courts. Because he has set us apart to be sanctified to walk in God's commands. Now, our deacons know this. We cannot walk in God's commands. We cannot lead God's church. It's that simple. Look at verse 8. Here now, O Joshua the high priest... This is so good. You and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who are a sign. Behold, I will bring my servant the branch. Wow. Circle that. The branch. If Zechariah's vision has been unclear up until this point, he makes it abundantly clear. The, the, the branch is the, the foundational chief cornerstone of reviving, redeeming, and restoring Israel with a brand new temple that will never, ever be destroyed. So the branch, messianic figure that all the Old Testament prophecies tell about, he, he's called a sprout, a righteous branch. Implication, Joshua the high priest is pointing to a new messianic figure, who will create a brand new type of temple that will never, ever be destroyed. Let me give you a little bit of language there. In English, the Hebrew name Yeshua is translated as Joshua in English. But in Luke 1, the archangel Gabriel tells Mary that her son would be called Yeshua. Isn't that amazing? Yeshua. Jesus is the new Joshua, Jesus, it's the new Joshua. Look at verse 9. Behold, on the stone that I have set before Joshua, 
On a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave its description, declares the Lord of hosts. I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. And in that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his vine and under his fig tree. In other words, look, we all stand guilty before a holy and righteous God. We do. The ultimate question is not, are we guilty? That's not the question. The question, church, listen, what do we do with the guilt? That's the question. What do we do with the guilt? Now, we could stand all day and talk about what you could do with your guilt. How do you handle guilt? Some of you can numb the pain, can't you? You can numb the pain. You can turn to prescription medication. You can turn to alcohol. You can chemically induce numbing the pain. You can obfuscate guilt momentarily. You can beat yourself up. You can deal with pain through discouragement, depression. You can dodge those feelings through working overtime at your job, eating extra Big Macs, doing anything that takes your mind off the pain. Anything that takes your mind off the guilt. If you don't hear anything that I say, just get this. Ready? The best remedy for guilt is to plead guilty. It's so free. It's so free. The best remedy for guilt is to plead guilty. Don't elude your guilt. Don't evade your guilt. And don't equivocate your sin and guilt with somebody else's. Plead guilty. You know why? You are. You are. And if you read Zechariah, you know that you are. Look, look at these next verses. Go back to Zechariah chapter 1. They're not going to be on the screen. I want us to read Zechariah chapter 1 together. And these verses are really a, a list of verses that, that call us to return and repent. That's the whole context of the minor prophets. So Zechariah chapter 1, verse 1. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechai, son of Iddo, saying, The Lord was, what, very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, Thus declares the Lord of hosts. Now here's the prescription for me and for you. Ready? Return to me, says the Lord of hosts. And what? I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Verse 4. Do not be like your fathers, to whom the former prophets cried out. Thus says the Lord of hosts, return from your evil ways, from your evil deeds. But they did not hear. Pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words, my statutes, which I commanded my servants to the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? They repented and said, as the Lord of hosts purposed to deal with us, for our ways indeed, so he has, what, dealt with us. So here we are, full circle. Remember the question we, we posed this morning? Here it is. What's the one thing that I've done that I feel guilty about? What's the thing that you need to come clean about, that you need to confess, that you need to have a contrite spirit I've got a friend who, uh, not really a friend, more of a, a colleague who pastored a church. We went to seminary together, and uh, he has been in the news related to revival. And last week they baptized, or last year rather, they baptized over 1,600 people. And he was asked the question, why the church was experiencing revival? And it was fascinating what he said. I, I would have never expected this response. Listen to what he said. He said, I was gut level honest with the Lord. Let me just read that again. I was gut level honest with the Lord. I didn't have an overt sin in my life, but the Holy Spirit has a way of pointing to our problems, doesn't he? I was arrogant, prideful, and I knew how to fish in the pond of fishing for approval of man. I was jealous in my heart if the church down the street baptized more than we did. I was jealous if a pastor had more influence than me in the community. The Lord reminded me 
that this was his church and nobody else's. Now listen to this part. Could it be that you are the blood clot that's keeping revival from this church? Could it be that you are the blood clot of revival from this church? How does revival happen? Here's where it gets good. Before God can birth something, there must be a death. A death to self. Before God can use you fully, He must own you completely. We have to die the death of ourselves in order to live for Him. Church, repentance is dying to yourselves. Baptism is public repentance. Luke 9, 23 says, If anyone come after me, take up him cross and follow me. So what do you say? What do you say before your eternal tribunal? It will, it will happen. It will happen. What are you going to say when Satan accuses you? Will you be condemned or will you be converted? Will you experience guilt or will you experience God's grace? Will you be denied or will you be delivered? Because that's the gospel that will save you. The gospel of Zechariah. Can you pray with me? My heads bowed and eyes closed this morning. I'm reminded of a verse in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. It says, repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus.